Retire with Manjula, a show about giving, featuring non-profit organizations, social activists, social entrepreneurs, and philanthropists who are giving back and making a difference. Retire with Manjula is a show that is a must-see. Welcome to Jai with Manjula. Countless studies and international organizations are concluding that investing in women is the single most effective way to address some of the world's most pressing problems. And our guest today, Kavita Ramdas, will tell us how. Kavita has been at the forefront of the global women's rights movement for the past 15 years. From 1996 through 2010, she served as the president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women, the largest foundation in the world to award grants exclusively to women and girls internationally. Since its founding in 1987, the Global Fund has mobilized nearly $85 million, providing grants to 4,200 groups in 171 countries. And for her extraordinary contribution, Kavita has been awarded numerous honors, including the Women Who Could Be President Award by the League of Women Voters and the 21 Leaders for the 21st Century Award by Women's E-News. And she continues her leadership today in an advisory capacity at the Global Fund and as a visiting fellow and scholar at the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. Kavita, welcome to Jai with Manjula. Thank you, Manjula. It's lovely to be here. Well, it's great to have you here to talk about gender inequity, its impact on society, and ways to address it. And I'll start with a statement that you have made, and I quote, The fundamental challenges for women remain. We are not considered equal partners in any place in the world, and there is evidence to show that on nearly every level. Could you expand on that? Uh, sure, I wish that uh, my uh, statement could be uh, held as not being true any longer, but unfortunately, if you opened this morning's New York Times and saw the front page article about how schools are actually uh, failing to deliver in the United States on Title IX, which um, basically was to provide for gender equity in sports uh, mm -hmm. for young women in the United States, um, they've just found a huge amount of fraud with regard to essentially schools uh, packing other uh, teams full of um, having male athletes practice with the women's basketball team, for example, and then saying, oh, we have a total of 34 in the women's basketball team when actually 17 of them are men. Oh. Uh, that's just the most uh, sort of lighthearted example, but mm -hmm. it's right here in the United States which prides itself as having um, really achieved Mm -hmm. um, gender equality in many different ways. Um, from that um, relatively, one might consider, minor issue um, to much more egregious violations of women's human rights on a daily basis, uh, such as the continuing violence against women in places mm -hmm. like um, our own country, India, yeah. as well as in many different parts of the African continent. Unfortunately, my statement mm -hmm. remains very much um, you know, true in terms of how deeply women are subjected mm. to inequality. And here even in the U.S., there's so much crime against women. Yeah, I mean, this is a country where one in uh, every six minutes a woman is subjected to sexual um, assault or rape, um, mm -hmm. and this is in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a country where, uh, despite the fact that we have protections um, under a number of laws that have passed since women earned the right to vote in 1921, we are still facing um, a very um, significant climate of violence against women, which makes it very, very difficult. I just mm -hmm. came back from a conference in which I watched a movie called Very Young Girls, in which I learned to my horror that the average age of a prostitute in the United States is 13. Wow. That's the average age. Mm -hmm. And there are girls who are younger who are in the sex trade. So I think, you know, clearly we have a long way to go, mm -hmm. even in the context of a country that is viewed as being amongst the most highly developed in the world. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, I uh, heard that only 7.3% of the foundation money goes to women's programs, and we spend much more on uh, drug trafficking than on human trafficking here in the U.S. also. 
Yeah, I think the I think the investments to you know while on the one hand there's been a lot of discussion and I think since the 70s in the development uh, literature and in the discussions at sort of uh, national and international levels there's been a lot of discussion about sort of the so-called feminization of poverty mm -hmm. the right. fact that women are disproportionately amongst the ranks of those who are poor mm -hmm. um, that somehow has not yet translated into the investments that need to be made mm -hmm. to balance that kind of inequality and so your statistic about 7.3% mm -hmm. being uh, the total amount that goes out of the over 90 billion dollars that goes every year in private philanthropy um, only 7.3% is actually targeting um, or goes to women and girls organizations that means that they are really trying to address those inequalities with much too limited resources right right And what are some of the other statistics about uh, what percentage of women are living in poverty, they are illiterate, or don't have health care, and uh, well, I mean, the, and all the statistics are very sobering, and you know, um, I think sometimes you hear a lot about the fact that people are more moved by the story of an individual woman or an individual mm -hmm. girl than they are by statistics. But I always think that the numbers are pretty daunting in them, right. in and of themselves. I mean, right. two thirds of those. who are out of school for example in in the world are girls um the vast majority of the world's labor is performed two thirds of the world's labor is performed by women and girls and yet women and girls own less than 1% of the total assets in the world um there are varying estimates that women and children and their dependent children make up as much as 70% of those who live below 2 dollars a day um in the world and i think the um, you know the other really to me very sobering statistic are again the statistics on violence the united nations fund for women uh, recently released a study saying one in three women so you know just here in our homes or in our in amongst our families one in every three women mm -hmm. has at some point in her life experienced sexual abuse that's and what are the numbers about maternal death um close to 500,000 women every year last year for the first time that number dipped slightly below 500,000 mm -hmm. but it's estimated that close to 500,000 or half a million women essentially every year die of entirely preventable causes related to childbirth and um unsafe or illegal abortions so you know the combination of those two and mm -hmm. i think it's interesting because uh, in the current debates around abortion in the united states uh, people are like oh you know you have to protect life you have to protect life but the irony is failing to give women who are um, in a process of um, being you know subjected to the experience of childbirth mm -hmm. the option to consider an abortion is actually something that doesn't value their life because childbirth is actually one of the most dangerous things a woman can do in mm -hmm. her life Now, coming back, there's another powerful statement that you have made, stressing women's influence, and I quote you again: "What is good for women is good for the planet." Tell us how that works, and also how will women's empowerment help the world, and what are the consequences if we do not end gender inequity? Well, the reason that what is good for women is good for the planet, I think, is because you cannot have a sustainable and healthy environment in which an entire half of the world's population is essentially relegated to second class status and doesn't have the opportunities to participate and to contribute to society in a full and free manner and i think that that is something that now we have overwhelming statistics to prove that um, you know the failure of countries to invest in the well being and the health of their um Uh, women and girls is something that actually leads to the downfall and the detriment of those societies itself that is both from an instrumentalist point of view so you know you can say a failure to invest in the well-being and health of women then leads to poor results with regard to childbirth the degree to which children are educated etc etc on the other hand i think it also leads to a failure of sort of a certain level of moral um Uh, compassion and a sense of a moral righteousness within a society which mm -hmm. is that you have if you have an entire group of people who essentially make up an underclass mm -hmm. inside that society you um 
will allow many other forms of injustice to go by. I often thought Afghanistan was a perfect example of that, mm -hmm. that the gender apartheid imposed on women was a sort of the first sign, alarm, that should have gone off for all of us. Mm -hmm. As if a society can treat women this badly, what else might be possible? Or what right. else is not happening in that right. society? And so mm -hmm. I think in that sense, you know, what is good for women is good for the planet. Um, lastly, I think on an environmental basis, um, investing in women's ability to have control over their own reproductive health and choices mm -hmm. is profoundly important for a planet that is already um, struggling to bear the weight of 7 billion people mm -hmm. and probably by 2020 we'll have 9 billion people. Right, right. right. So right. I think those are all reasons why, you know, failing to invest in women's well-being and women's mm -hmm. full equality will actually end up making all of us pay a very high price in the long run. And how is the Global Fund uh, for Women helping women around the world? And what is its approach? What is the scope of its work? You have been the president and CEO there for nearly 15 years. Um, the Global Fund for Women is very unique in its approach to investing in women's rights. It really believes that women themselves have the answers to many of the most pressing challenges. And so its model is very much premised on listening and learning from women on the ground. So rather than sitting and deciding what the priorities should be for women in Burkina Faso or women in India or women in um, Bolivia, really the approach of the Global Fund is to hear from women themselves. Let them tell us what they see as being a priority. Mm -hmm. So for women in South Africa, it might be around questions of violence. For women in Eastern Europe, it might be around access to employment or addressing human trafficking. For women in very rural areas of India, it might be about um, being able to have better protection in terms of issues with regard to uh, land rights and inheritance of property rights. Mm -hmm. And in each case, I think the Global Fund has tried to respond to what women themselves see as their priorities. I think two things that make it unique, we accept applications in any language and in any uh -huh. format that allows okay. women to speak in their own words. Okay. And then secondly, we give the grants in general support. Mm -hmm. So we don't say to a women's uh, organization, oh, you can only use this for medicines. Um, we say to the women's group, you know how best to use this money. Okay. If you need it to fix a hole in the roof, or if mm -hmm. you need it to buy a van, or if you need it to buy a computer, that's okay. your choice. You make that decision. Okay, and what kind of um, impact have you seen with the support? Well, I think we've seen a remarkable impact, um, mainly in terms of the ripple effect that this mm -hmm. empowerment of women in the local community has. Uh, one small story, I was in Burkina Faso, which used to be called Upper Volta, a small country in the west of Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went because the women in the village had re requested uh, $5,000 to purchase a grain mill in mm -hmm. the village. And many people said, well, what difference does this make? How is this related to women's mm -hmm. rights? When I got there, the women took me around the village and they showed me how women and girls spend up to eight hours uh, a day pounding millet in these big, um, basically, um, uh, you know, uh, their uh, mortar and pestles. And they said, look, there is a school in the nearby village, mm -hmm. but our girls can't go to that school because they are spending six to eight hours a, a day right. pounding millet. Mm -hmm. But if we had a grain mill, mm -hmm. we could do what we are doing now in eight hours we could do it in an hour mm -hmm. and our girls could go to school and they could have different kinds of opportunities. Very so I think, attention. you know, this was a way in which one can think about sort of the many ripples that mm -hmm. result from a very small act mm -hmm. and one that one may not seem to be so powerful. Or in a different case, a $5,000 grant we made to a group of women teaching underground schools during the time of the Taliban. Nice. Now that organization reaches more than 400,000 girls and boys mm -hmm. all across Afghanistan. Okay. They have become a model mm -hmm. for education in the country. And, you know, I think those are, you know, two examples of how a very small amount of money can make a very big difference. And what is the size of your grants, typically? Um, typically, a first-time grant can be as small as two or three thousand dollars to a maximum of thirty thousand dollars. But an sorry. average is usually um, ten to eleven thousand dollars. And how do they qualify for it? What's the criteria? Um, I think the most important criteria are that it is an effort that is um, owned by women in the community itself, that mm -hmm. it's women-led, 
that it's not just one individual woman, but that it's really owned by a larger group. Um, and that um, there is a very important criteria that women should be able to have control over how the financial resources are actually used. Mm -hmm. um, in many instances, you hear from organizations who say, oh, we plan to do this and this to uplift women. And then you look at the organization and it turns out that men are in control of almost all the decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the kind of organization that the Global Fund wants to invest in. In part because with our investments, we're also sending a message mm -hmm. into those communities saying that women can be leaders in their own societies. Yes. And I think that is a very important you know, psychological mm -hmm. support to the mm -hmm. women's groups we are providing. I believe the Global Fund has raised about $85 million. So how do you raise funds? Who are your donors? Our donors are um, everyday people like you and me. Um, everything from the little girl who sends us her bat mitzvah or birthday check for $25 all the way to the individual um, who might write us a check for $100,000. Mm -hmm. uh, they include people who run a shoe store in Palo Alto called In Her Shoes, of which 100% of the profits go to the Global Fund for Women, yes. to um, a group of nuns. I just recently um, met a group of uh, nuns who deeply believe in our message of equality for women and who have been quietly supporting the Global mm -hmm. Fund with a $50 donation every year. That's a really wide range. Um, but we also depend um, about 45% of our revenues come from um, individuals. Right. And 55% um, of our total revenues come from foundations and some corporations, uh, some very progressive-minded corporations. Right. And mostly um, from the U.S. or from other countries? Primarily from the U.S., although we have donors in over 40 countries all over the world. Okay. But I would say in terms of the um, relative amounts, mm -hmm. the vast majority is raised here. It's actually one of the great um, um, gifts, I think, of American society. This is a society that is deeply philanthropic mm -hmm. and I think understands a level of individual responsibility which um, I hope we can share with the rest of the world. Um, one thing the Global Fund for Women has done in its time has been to fund other women's funds like us mm -hmm. but in different parts of the world. So there are now 22 women's funds all over the world including India, including Ghana mm -hmm. um, and uh, Chile and other parts where they're trying to replicate what we have done here um, in their own countries and in their own um, parts of the world so that it becomes more mm -hmm. sustaining. Right. So, um, Sounds wonderful. Yeah, it has been wonderful. So you're helping women in 171 countries, I heard, through 4,200 uh, projects, that's what it is. So how many lives do you think you have touched? Well, you know, it's interesting. People always want to measure it in terms of, you know, how many million lives. I think probably many millions of lives, but um, perhaps many more in terms of the impact that, um, you know, that change in the status of women can have. And uh, tell me about your involvement with women's rights. How did you get involved? What Was there something in your upbringing that triggered this interest, sparked this interest? Very much. I'm the eldest of three daughters and uh, as you know, growing up in India, one often hears, oh, what a pity you don't have any sons. Uh, this was often something that my parents uh, were told by friends and that we heard growing up. Yes, and I always are more bothered. <laughs> yeah. And I always thought, well, that's very strange. Uh, why do they think that being a girl right. is somehow less mm -hmm. than? And as I grew up, um, I think uh, both hearing from my parents that I was not only as good as a boy but perhaps better than, than yeah. any boy who they could imagine, um, I think, you know, gave me a great sense that there were some real profound inequalities in mm -hmm. our societies. I also saw it in my own family. So I think I very early on had a sense of injustice that needed to I be see. addressed. Mm -hmm. um, that was then further inspired by my mother who was very involved with social justice movements in India and particularly oh. with the women's movement. Oh, so, um, she yeah, started doesn't fall far from right. the thing, so that's, the, right. that's where it comes exactly. from. Exactly. So I she's very that. much an inspiration. So she is your person. inspiration, your very, hero. Yes. That's great. And as we were talking earlier, you said you have a daughter. And I would love to find out how your beliefs have influenced her and how have you raised her? What tips would you give to parents, especially to mothers out there about raising empowered daughters? 
Um, I think our daughters are actually amazingly strong human beings from the time they actually first arrive in our worlds. Mm -hmm. And I think very often we as mothers have to be careful because we impart to them the lessons we learned about what it meant to be a good woman or to be a good wife or to mm -hmm. be a good daughter. So and I think uh, we have a lot of unlearning to do and actually learning from our daughters rather than teaching them. Okay. Uh, so I would say that um, one, of the, one of the biggest lessons is to allow your daughter to really be who she is and to pay attention to who she is as mm -hmm. she is as she is becoming that person. Um, in my case, um, my daughter um, loves to play soccer. It's not something that mm -hmm. I had any experience with, but I think encouraging her to do what she loves mm -hmm. and supporting her to do that and mm -hmm. believing that you know uh, it was her way of showing her sense of being strong and confident. Mm -hmm. On the issue of uh, human rights, women's rights, is there a book or a movie that you recommend? Um, there's a wonderful book by a colleague um, who teaches at Berkeley, a sociologist called Arlie Hochschild, that she wrote together with Barbara Ehrenreich, and it's called Global Women, Nannies, Maids, and Sex Workers. Oh. I would highly recommend it. It's okay. about 10 years old now, but I think mm -hmm. the issues it raises are um, really significant. And for a more recent book, I think the um, book that... Uh, um, Cheryl Wudan and Nicholas Kristoff wrote together called um, uh, Half the Sky um, really is a good introduction for people who don't know the extent to which women suffer inequality and injustice around the world. I think it's a very good introduction mm -hmm. to um, those issues. And uh, Kavita, you won the Women Who Could Be President Award given by the League of Women Voters. So let's talk about that. If you were to be president, what would you do to improve women's status in the U.S. and globally? And what kind of po kind of policies and uh, uh, programs would you introduce? Well, I think the very first thing that I would do if I was president would be to sign the Convention for Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is known as the UN Human Rights Treaty. Uh, shortly, that would be a message to the world that the United States stands in solidarity with all the other countries that have made that commitment. Uh, I think secondly, I would pass the ERA, which has been languishing since 1973, which is a basic concept, equal pay for equal work. Right. Right. Nothing dramatic or you know strange about that, yes. and yet um, I think it would be the most effective anti-poverty strategy mm -hmm. possible. And then lastly, I would work on a question of quotas, because I think um, without full participation of women in all levels of government, uh, the United States will continue to be at where it is right now, which is 14% of women represented in a country where women are more than 50% of sure. the population. Sure, sure, sure. And now that you have ended your tenure at the Global Fund, what are your plans? Well, I'm uh, looking forward to spending a little bit of time in uh, academia uh -huh. at Stanford University. Uh -huh. um, and in particular, I hope to be able to marry together the worlds of philanthropy, activism, and uh, academia and by bringing activists onto campus from all over the world. Okay, so no time to kick back and relax. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it will be relatively relaxing after the 14 years of the Global Fund. Okay. Um, being able to cycle to work rather than have to fly around the world will definitely be a pleasant change. I'm also, uh, I'm a very dedicated uh, yogini. Um, so I've been doing yoga since I was oh. 12 years old um, oh. and uh, find it very relaxing and um, and I also love to sing. So uh, maybe in maybe in this next avatar, I'll have a little bit more time oh, for music love to in my life. Sing sometime. <laughs> <laughs> and before we go, what is your advice to women about self empowerment, and what is your message to uh, society at large? Um, I would say it's really important for women to believe in themselves and um, to speak up. I think Indian women, in particular, have been mm -hmm. told for a long time to sort of keep their voices low and to you know. Um, accept kind of their positions in life and I think uh, creating a little bit of a stir and um, you know mm -hmm. speaking up when you see something that's unjust or unfair not just mm -hmm. for yourself but for others um, is a really important way in which we can begin to make a difference. Okay, great. On that inspiring note, Kavita, thank you so much for making time for this and for the crucial work that you are doing for women's rights and women around the world for you and thank you. Thank you, Anshay. Thank you so much. 
That's all we have for you today. Our guest was Kavita Ramdas, who until recently was the president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women, the largest grant-making foundation in the world focused exclusively on supporting international women's human rights, where she continues to provide leadership and direction. For more information, you may go to their website, globalfundforwomen.org, and you may watch this show again at jaiwithmanjula.org. Thank you all for joining us. I'll be back with another inspiring story about giving and people making a difference. For Chai with Manjula, I'm Manjula Gupta. See you next time.